Jesus diet sound so problematically familiar. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Let me pop in here super quick, folks, because I'm so excited to be working with Element. This is a product that I was using years ago when I was on my breastfeeding saga, and it really helped me recover. And I also use it a lot in the summer when I'm playing tennis in the heat, and it's always in my bag when I travel. Not to mention, a lot of my colleagues who work in sports nutrition swear by Element specifically because it's got a science-backed electrolyte ratio of 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium, and it's got no no colors, sugars, or fillers. I've also found that having my electrolytes in the morning has had a really big positive impact on my sleep. So even on days when I'm not sweating a lot, I will usually still have half a packet. I love all things spicy, so the mango chili is always my fave, but they've got nine different flavors, including their new chocolate caramel, which is so strangely addictive. Right now, Element is offering my viewers a free sample pack with any order, so that's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try eight other flavors or share Element with a salty friend. So get yours at drinkelement.com slash Abby Sharp, and this deal is only available through my link. So you have to go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash Abby Sharp. Today we're going to be revisiting a super problematic diet that I thought we had put to bed like eight years ago. But here we are, another beautiful fit blonde on social media making a meal out of a crate of bananas. Yep, we're talking about the infamous Raw Till 4 high carb, low fat, low protein diet consisting largely of fruit, lettuce, and potatoes. If this sounds familiar to you, you are probably an OG Abby's Kitchen fan, so thank you guys so much for your loyalty. We love that. But it's because I actually got my start here on YouTube debunking this dangerous raw vegan frugivore diet, made famous by, well, another beautiful fit blonde. So there was a time when I was receiving hundreds of messages and emails and DMs from young girls following this diet and suffering from horrendous outcomes. Hair loss, raging blood sugars, acne, severe IBS flares, muscle wasting, amenorrhea, and a lot more. It is also not lost on me that this is a very similar protocol to the one followed by Russian raw vegan frugivore, Zana de Art, who passed away in the summer at age 39, allegedly related to malnutrition. So, I don't know, this feels a bit like a passing of the torch to the next generation of raw vegan frugivores. And of course, I have to worry about a similar fate. But we will be talking calories and restricted eating today, so that's just a little heads up here. Um, and if you're not already subscribed, I would love if you would. And also check out my free hunger crushing combo ebook in the description below. But let's get into some of Paige's videos and take a look at what she recommends eating to prevent weight gain, to lose weight, or to get rid of cellulite. Newsflash, there is no diet specifically to do that. But I eat in a day so I can eat as much as I want and never have to worry about weight gain. For breakfast, I'm having four pounds of watermelon. For lunch, I'm eating five Envy apples. For a snack, I'm having a cluster of green grapes. And for dinner, I've got a fresh crispy romaine salad along with yellow curry potato soup. Now this is dangerous and frankly just an incorrect assertion. It doesn't matter what kind of diet you wanna follow, keto, Weight Watchers, calorie counting, or raw till four, weight loss or weight gain comes down to calories. And if this works for Paige or for others, it's because you've been able to create a calorie deficit, not because it's super satiating. In fact, despite this diet being made up of only fruit and vegetables, it is super low in hunger crushing compounds. Now I'm not 100% sure what's in the soup, but I estimated around 2000 calories, 34 grams of protein, 19 grams of fat, and 54 grams of fiber. And sure, the fiber is a lot higher than the national average, but it only makes up about 12% of total carbs. Not great when we're not even hitting the bare minimum protein targets. So I would argue that most people would not feel very full at all on a diet like this. And if you did, it would be because of the sheer volume or low caloric density of the foods, which she elaborates on here. The average American has about four pounds of food every day. I eat over double that. I always start my morning off with half of a watermelon, which comes out to four and a half pounds. Next up is six bananas at 1.3 pounds. 
For dinner, I eat this entire bowl of soup, which has two pounds of potatoes in it. I also have a large salad that weighs about a half a pound. The fact that eating eight pounds of food is treated as like a flex is kind of a red flag to me. Now, I'm not diagnosing anyone with anything. I'm simply gonna speak from my own experience as a dietitian and also someone who has had an eating disorder. But bragging about my massive meal portions was exactly what I used to do to try to hide my disorder. You know, I was like, look at all the food I eat. There can't be anything wrong with me. Look, I eat. See, I eat a lot. And honestly, it kind of worked. Like people saw me eat a lot, so they were thrown off on any suspicions that something was wrong. But eating massive amounts of ultra low calorie foods in an attempt to stretch the vagus nerve and like trick my body into thinking that I was truly nourished was a clear sign of my ED. You know, I just wanted so badly to feel full, like super full, like physically a full, full belly. And the only way to do that while not gaining weight was to eat massive amounts of lettuce, broth, and water-rich fruit. Obviously, there is some merit to consuming more high volume foods when on a weight loss diet, and that doesn't necessarily mean one has an ED. I mean, we've got lots of research to support that method. But I think it's important to remind ourselves that even if you can hack your brain into thinking it's full by filling your gut with a ton of water in bulk, the likelihood of feeling satisfied is super, super slim. Like I ran that race and it was very short lived. You cannot marathon it out on a hyper restrictive diet like that without it completely messing with your head. And this sentiment from Paige on oils also feels very, very familiar. The next thing I stopped eating was oil. I was all into the keto vibe. And the thing is, is like oil is not satiating and satisfying. Oil does not fill you up. All oil does is just give you extra calories without actually giving you any bulk behind those calories, without actually filling you up and making you full and satisfied. I was very strong keto, so I was like 80% of my diet was fat. My stomach was never getting filled up. It was just a bunch of high fat foods that I was eating. First of all, I generally think it's a red flag when I see folks yo-yo from one extreme diet to another. Like case in point, high fat keto to low fat raw vegan. Like why do we need to make eating so f complicated? No, but seriously, here is my take on oils and fats while trying to lose weight. Fats contain more calories per gram than protein or carbs, but they are also very slow digesting, so they stabilize our insulin levels and keep you feeling fuller for longer. Now, when weight loss is the goal, I do think we wanna get the bulk of our healthy fats from whole food sources where they are bundled up with other hunger crushing compounds. So avocado, for example, is rich in healthy fats and fiber. Nuts have healthy fats, protein, and fiber. Salmon has healthy fats and protein, etc. Now oils are just pure fat, AKA they are only one hunger crushing compound. But that doesn't mean they don't contribute to fullness or satisfaction or that they cannot fit in a weight loss diet. On the contrary, research suggests that added oil does help to reduce appetite and hunger hormones when added to our meals. It also makes food taste better, which is super important for the satisfaction piece. Like I would be so miserable eating dry lettuce with no dressing. You bet I would be face planting into a family sized bag of chips. And on top of the oil rant, let's clear up some science. It's really easy for your body to convert the fat that you eat into the fat that you wear. So it takes a lot less energy for the body to convert dietary fat into fat storage on the body. But it's a lot harder and takes more energy to convert carbohydrates into fat storage, which makes sense because fat is already fat. So it's easy to convert dietary fat into fat storage because it's already fat. That is not how weight gain works. Carbs may be our body's preferred fuel for immediate energy, but that doesn't mean that they can't be converted to fat. In fact, if you really wanna get down to the nitty gritty, you could maybe argue that foods that increase insulin or promote insulin resistance may preferentially promote fat storage. And if that's what weight gain actually came down to, then carbs might actually be the bigger culprit, particularly low fiber, high sugar carbs like bananas, grapes, watermelon, etc. 
But as I discussed in my video on insulin right here, the truth is all of those details kind of come out in the wash. So ultimately, it really doesn't matter what the energy source is. If you have more calories, AKA energy, than what you need, that substrate is going to be stored as fat. Carbs too. How much of your diet should be carbohydrates? What should be protein and what should be fat? What percentage should all of this be? So I like to stick to 80% of my overall calories coming from clean carbohydrates, 10% from fat and 10% from protein. And the beautiful thing is, is that when you're eating the right foods, you're gonna naturally fall into this macronutrient ratio without even trying. You don't have to count your macros. You don't have to stress out and put everything into my fitness pal. No, none of that. That's why this lifestyle is so free because as long as you're eating the right foods, you're naturally gonna fall into that 80-10-10 macronutrient ratio without even having to try. Probably not. I mean, assuming that calories are appropriate, North Americans pretty consistently consume about 15% of their calories from protein. There's actually a really interesting concept called the protein leverage hypothesis that suggests that protein intake is more strongly regulated in the body than the intake of carbohydrates and fats. And when we reduce our protein intake below 15%, we compensate by increasing our calories until we reach that 15%. So if you're not also carefully controlling calories and you're just going hog wild on all the fruit, there is a pretty good chance you are not gonna end up in a calorie deficit. Now, I could have easily been off on my calculations above seeing as I don't know what she puts in her soup, but what I calculated was even more extreme than what she recommends here. And what she recommends is pretty bad, especially for weight loss. I talked about optimal macros for weight loss in my video right here, but fat loss increases fourfold when we go from 10 to 15% of our calories from protein to 20 to 30%. But even if fat loss is not the goal, this is not even enough for like baseline bare minimum health. The lowest of the low recommendations for protein is 0.8 to one gram per kilogram of body weight. And that is like bottom of the barrel basic. That is not if we are trying to lose weight or build muscle. So for a 120 pound person, that is just 43 to 54 grams of protein per day. That is really so little in my professional opinion. And yet, this diet doesn't even provide that. Poor protein intake can result in muscle wasting, reduced energy digestibility, and fatty liver. And these effects can persist well beyond quitting the diet. Ditto for low fat. We know that fat intakes below 20% can result in hormone dysregulation. So basically low testosterone in men and low estrogen in women, which obviously can affect fertility. You know, I keep thinking that debunking content like this is like Captain Obvious, like no sh Sherlock, it is not a good idea to eat four pounds of watermelon every single day. But then I see comments like this and I'm like, I have so much empathy for the vulnerable individuals who are following this. And well, of course, there will always be folks on the fringes who will thrive on a diet like this, but it is a pretty slippery slope for like everyone else. So bottom line folks, fruit is amazing. Fruit is nutritious. I love fruit, but a girl cannot thrive on fruit alone, even if you throw in some potatoes. So if you were looking for specific details on the optimal macro splits for your specific goals, definitely check out my video right here. And on that note, that's all that I have for you guys today. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would love to hear your comments below. Keep it kind, we do wanna be respectful here. And I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye. Come on, Poppy. Oh, she's a good girl.